Decades of fairy tales and family movies have conditioned us into expecting an ending where the hero conquers the threat, overcomes the odds, and fulfills their dreams. Most of Pixar's own movies feature characters ready to risk it all for these great, life-consuming passions. And don't get me wrong, they make great stories, but not very good lessons. And in this way, Soul is one of the very few mainstream movies that subverts our expectations. And warning, spoilers ahead. The film centers around Joe Gardiner, an aspiring jazz player stuck as a part-time band teacher when the day that he finally gets his chance at playing a big jazz show, falls down a manhole and enters a coma. Confronted with the afterlife, he defies fate, and instead of crossing into the great beyond, his soul enters the great before, a place where souls go before being born as humans. After 90 minutes of classic Pixar hijinks, Joe regains his body, plays the big jazz show he's always dreamt of, and nothing goes wrong. He basically accomplishes everything he'd been working towards his whole life. And in any other movie, this would be the end. But after finally achieving his dreams, he learns it wasn't all he had built it up to be, and that he had been approaching life the wrong way altogether. By the end of the film, Joe learns that his obsession with jazz had been inhibiting his ability to live life fully. Instead of focusing on singular passions, the movie tells us that the mere act of living is something to be enjoyed. And so the movie ends on an ambiguous note. So, what do you think you'll do? How are you going to spend your life? I'm not sure, but I do know I'm going to live every minute of it. Pixar's soul rebels against the long history of Disney movies that take the exact opposite approach towards having dreams and passions. And in a world where hustle and grind culture compel you to grind away at an end goal similar to Joe, it's an appreciated message. But how did we get to a place where that mentality is so widespread? There's actually a pretty deep and political history here. You see, back in the 1960s countercultural era, people were rebelling in a million different ways. They were wearing their hair long, dressing differently, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know the story. One of the outgrowths of this era was the human potential movement, a movement that can best be summarized by this quote from HPM advocate Glenn Doman. Every child born has, at the moment of birth, a greater potential intelligence than Leonardo da Vinci ever used. The movement's followers believed that by developing human potential, we can experience greater levels of happiness, creativity, and fulfillment. They built off the work of Abraham Maslow and believed that as we addressed our needs in each level of the pyramid, we can unlock different states of being. And at the highest level of the pyramid, we could reach self-actualization. And to reach that goal, HPM advocates turned their attention to the workplace. To them, work could no longer be just a place you clock into every day and mostly hate. To ascend the hierarchy of needs, we needed to find fulfillment in what we did. You've probably heard the quote, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And while some wrongly attribute it to Confucius, it actually originated from a philosophy professor in 1982, right in the middle of this cultural transformation. Now, okay, don't get me wrong, a big part of the movement was just people taking a lot of acid and trying to transcend into other dimensions, but the lasting impact of this era can still be felt today in personal development and humanistic psychology, which are fields that center the personal and emotional growth of the self. For example, today's managerial strategies focus on the human development aspect of being a manager, human resources is an ever-expanding industry, and even McDonald's centers the self with its McDonald's Works For Me campaign. And when you think about it, it's kind of hard to put a negative spin on all this. I mean, we should live life to the fullest, and we should be the best versions of ourselves both in the workplace and at home. Centering the self, centering your personal development and growth, it's kind of hard to hate on. These are common folksy wisdoms that I think few people could disagree with. But uh, here I am writing this video to disagree with it. 
Famous philosopher Slavoj Žižek often shares a funny observation about contemporary society. Back in the Victorian age, we were taught to repress our desires. We would go get psychoanalyzed if we enjoyed things like sex too much. But today, we go to a psychiatrist if we don't enjoy things enough. Back then, the desires of the self were secondary to God, the church, the king, the family, and so on. But now, the self is at the center of our world. And according to him, this has made all of us subscribe to a sort of enlightened hedonism. I think that today, the predominant form of ideology is a kind of enlightened hedonism. It's not sacrifice yourself for your country. The predominant ideology in the West is some kind of a slightly spiritualized, this is why Dalai Lama is so popular, slightly spiritualized hedonism. Mm -hmm. Be yourself. Make something out of yourself. Be what you truly authentic are. Realize your potential. Be true to yourself. And so on, all that stuff. Pixar's soul is very much still subversive in the animated world, but in its subversion against one cultural trend, it affirms another just as powerful trend. And there's one line close to the end of the film that I found really interesting. Do you have a moment? I think I'm speaking for all the Jerry's when I say thank you. For what? We're in the business of inspiration, Joe, but it's not often we find ourselves inspired. Huh. This line almost feels self-aware from Pixar, because at a certain level, they don't sell us movies, they sell us inspiration packaged as a motion picture. So while on first viewing it might seem like Soul stands apart from the rest of Pixar's movies, it's not that different, because they're unable to make anything that runs counter to their message that sells enlightened hedonism. Now, combine this with another aspect of the film, the rawness in which it represents city life. Unlike the rest of Disney's or Pixar's movies, Soul takes place in an almost lifelike portrayal of New York. The buildings are cracked, the streets are dirty, people are tired and unfriendly. The underbelly of a big city can be a cold place. They basically say as much in the movie. Don't worry about it, it's the subway. It does that to some people. It does what? It wears you down. It stinks, it's hot, it's crowded. Every day the same thing, day in and day out. There's an unflinching acknowledgement that life for regular people isn't Disney magic. It's actually pretty tiring. And in the face of the struggle, Soul tells us that every minute of life is worth living. And I'm not going to sit here and say that that message is unwelcome, because sometimes you need that mushy sentimentality to keep you going. And I think this realistic setting invites a more realistic interpretation of the film. We're not living in some magical fantasy land with real talking toys. I mean, this is the real world and all of its shitty glory. And if you consider that, it's a pretty self-serving message for Disney, because that seize the moment attitude is one of the core pillars of consumerism. Once people subscribe to enlightened hedonism, they're only one step away from buy this product to reach your potential, you know what I mean? You could say enlightened hedonism is a justifying ideology to consumerism. It's the ideology one has to adopt to participate in consumerism. And sure, the movie never actually makes the connection to consumerism, Joe never lives his best life by buying some Nikes, but I think it's an important connection to make, because American media is flooded with inspirational messages like this. Live life to the fullest is probably the second most popular message in American media, right behind follow your dreams. And this is important because it might not be the greatest life advice. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you what the secret to life is in this video. I'm a political YouTuber, not Jordan Peterson. I don't really know how we should live our lives, but as we critically analyze this film's message, it's important to know that it's not the only recipe for life. Take for example, the Blackfoot people's alternative to Maslow's pyramid. There's actually evidence Maslow borrowed Blackfoot beliefs for his pyramid of needs, but regardless, while Maslow's pyramid starts with physical needs and ends with self-actualization, the Blackfoot breadth of life theory starts with self-actualization. Developing the self is only the starting point, and you're supposed to move towards community actualization and then cultural actualization 
as you teach future generations about your culture. And this is just a gross oversimplification, and I'm not too well versed in indigenous worldview models, but I hope it illustrates how diverse attitudes towards life can be. It's just one example of many worldviews out there that don't center the self. Because maybe the self isn't the most important thing. And just like Pixar's soul shows us that follow your dreams is kind of a played out message, maybe so is live life to the fullest. I don't know, but what I do know is that after a closer inspection, soul's folksy wisdom carries a lot more cultural baggage than first meets the eye. But what do you think? Let me know down below.